It's always fascinated me the idea of one of the most important scientists of all time was actually pretty awful at school. At school, Darwin's head seemed to always be in the clouds. Teachers seemed to be always be frustrated with him. But it was his, at his time at school that Darwin sort of began collecting. He was a collector first and foremost, which is what many geologists can be said. He collected beetles, that was his main thing, collected specimens, anything that he could really find. Upon leaving school, Darwin travels up to Edinburgh to study medicine at university. Due to the particularly grisly nature of studying medicine, especially in the Victorian era, you can imagine it was probably absolutely hellish, he ended up changing and moving down to Cambridge to study theology. In many ways, Darwin's life at that point was mapped out ahead of him. He was going to join the church, he had a nice little parish, and he would have done his hobby, which is geology, on the side. During his time at Cambridge, Darwin strikes up a very good friendship with his professor, a man called Henslow. Now, Henslow was a bit of a geologist himself, and also Henslow is incredibly important in the history of Darwin, and indeed, the publication of Origin. If Darwin hadn't struck up such a good friendship with Henslow, Darwin would never have ever joined the Beagle. So after leaving Cambridge, Darwin still has a very strong friendship with Henslow. And as I said, it was through Henslow that Darwin secured his position on the HMS Beagle. It wasn't something Darwin was looking for at all. But a man called Captain Fitzroy, who also knew Henslow very well, was looking for a geologist to join his expedition to South America and the Galapagos Islands. They're going to survey the land, and if you think about it, Nowadays, we take it for granted that everything is mapped out. Back then, South America and the Galapagos still was in many ways considered to be a very strange land. However, there is a slight problem to this. Darwin's father is not happy at all. Darwin needs his dad to stump up the money for him to be able to join this, what was meant to be a two-year expedition, of which Darwin's father says no from the get-go. Although Darwin, alongside Henslow, eventually manages to persuade his father that this is a very important trip for him to go on, and that as soon as he comes back, he's joining the church. In Darwin's mind, this is in many ways much like a sort of gap year for our sort of generation. Darwin was going to go on this for two years, but when he went on this trip, he was going to go out into the world and see the world as God created it. It was something he was so excited about doing. So now cast your mind back to the night before the voyage sets off. Darwin is in his bunk in Plymouth, and he's brought with him two books, one of which is the Bible, the other of which is Paradise Lost. Now, Paradise Lost is what fascinates me most. It actually might be across the entire history of Darwin and indeed Origin Species, it might be the thing that fascinates me more than anything. Not only have I sold a few examples of Paradise Lost, which is a fascinating book, but also if you think about the, what it deals with, Paradise Lost deals with both the creation and the fall. Darwin going out into the world on this trip is going to see the true roots of creation. His evolutionary theory will take seed at this time. But also alongside that, Darwin will witness his own fall from God. Now on the Beagle itself, the ship has set sail. What was meant to be a two year trip turns into five long, arduous years. Darwin discovers actually incredibly quickly that he suffers from seasickness. That also isn't helped by the fact he shares a tiny bunk with the captain Fitzroy. Fitzroy seemingly at the beginning was a very nice man, but as the trip went on, it turned out he did quite like a drink and could be quite argumentative at times. For the young Darwin, this was quite difficult. Any opportunity they had to moor in a harbor or to go onto land Darwin be running straight onto land. As much time as he spent on land rather than be on the ship was happy for him. But it also meant that because Darwin was so desperate to spend so much time on land, this is where he really starts sowing the seeds of his evolutionary theory. It's here that he witnesses different birds and suddenly realizes that actually they are the same species, yet with minute differences. And where do they come from? So the Beagle is in many ways Darwin's coming of age. He's left university, he's gonna step out into the world, but instead he finds himself on a five-year voyage, suffering from seasickness with a very angry captain. It's a very interesting time in his life. You know, if our generation takes gap years, you can consider this to be Darwin's gap year. But instead of full moon parties in Thailand, Darwin comes up with a theory of evolution. So now Darwin is back at home and Captain Fitzroy is writing a book of his time on the Beagle. He asked Darwin, at this point, if he could contribute maybe a small chapter, sort of, you know, notes from the geologists on the trip. Well, Darwin, who kept a very strong journal of his time out there, did a lot more than just a chapter. Darwin supplied pretty much an entire book. This was submitted to the publishers, and the publishers loved it so much, they actually published separately to Fitzroy's narrative. It is absolutely fascinating. At this time, as soon as it was published, it became a bestseller. You know, at that time, Victorian readerships, they loved travelogues. So instead of this being a very geological or scientific text, actually, for Victorian readership, it was considered a very fascinating tale. 
So Darwin has now discovered he has a very good writing style. It is then still 20 years after that that Darwin published Origin of Species, 20 years in which he knew he had to prove this theory. In those 20 years, Darwin's relationship with God falls further and further and further until it's non-existent. He is a full-on atheist. There is very much sort of blood, sweat and tears in Origin of Species. It's, you know, Darwin, he bore himself to the brink of madness. He had a nervous breakdown in publishing this. I think it's kind of, you know, you hear so many writers who are desperate to get the words onto pages, but for Darwin, it was, you know, this was everything. This was Darwin's life work. So I suppose the sort of big question here is what is Darwin's theory of evolution? Well, to put it quite simply, it is a process by which species evolve by natural selection. If you think about it, you know, the natural world isn't this beautiful, harmonious place, but actually is a very harsh, very intense world. Animals will kill other animals. Species will die out. They don't have enough food, they don't have enough water. If they're not adapted to their environment. Darwin called all this survival of the fittest. Only the fittest and the strongest can and will survive. Sadly, though, in many ways, when it was published, Darwin didn't want to publish at that time. He wasn't ready. He had more theories he wanted to go into. He wanted to go into different places with it. And he wanted to especially look more into the relationship of man with other animals, which he did in kind of later editions and later books. But another scientist by the name of Wallace, who was also researching similar things to Darwin, whilst out on an expedition himself and suffering from a very bad fever, sent Darwin a letter. In this letter, he essentially laid out what Darwin had spent 20 years trying to pull together. This for Darwin at a time when his mind was already not in a particularly great place, pretty much sent him over the edge. He then knew at that point that he had to publish Origin. Luckily for him, in the, I think it's the Geological Society, when they put out this information, because Darwin approached them and obviously Wallace did, they put it out together by showing these two men had come to theory at the same time. And I think what fascinates me about Wallace in many ways, and I think, which obviously goes into sort of what is so important, about origin species in Darwin's writing style is, let's say if Wallace had got there first, if Darwin had had his full-on breakdown and had never stepped near the idea of writing origin again, you know, we would have had evolutionary theory and other science would have got there, but it would have got there in a very different way. You wouldn't have this beautifully written text. Instead, what most likely, and there's no discredit to Wallace here, you'd have a full-on scientific tract, something that if you're not in the science community, you'd never be able to understand. So on the 24th of November, 1859, John Murray publishes Darwin's Origin of Species. 1,250 examples were published and they sell out on the first day. Back then, society was very, very much bound by the church. So whilst a lot of scientists and a lot of contemporaries of Darwin's knew about what Darwin was coming up with, and also, you know, there were many other theories coming out at the same time, the general public didn't. So imagine if all of a sudden, someone publishes a book which is completely the antithesis of anything you've ever been told to believe. Suddenly, the world is not created in you know, God's image, that God has created every single animal. All of a sudden, a man comes out and tells you that actually, no, God didn't create all this. It's a process of evolution and that you are not a singularly important being, but actually you are a mere animal created by common descent. You are related to apes. It also led to, I think it was about two or three weeks later, the Archbishop of Canterbury delivered a speech in which he said that the two could live hand in hand. I think the church realized very quickly that, wow, this theory, one, has taken on so much ground by, you know, becoming an absolute phenomenon for the moment it's published. But two, they kind of needed to say something. Um, so their response to it was that the two can potentially live hand in hand. But whilst God might not have created every animal individually, that God created the systems in place for that to happen. And it's interesting for me, once the book was published, this debate raged on. There was people on the side of, you know, total belief in evolutionary history and theory, and people on the side of, well, actually, no, this is all completely wrong, and God, God created everything. Darwin sort of stayed out of it, actually, which I think is quite interesting in itself. But yeah, if you look at what was going on at the time, yeah, it was almost like a sort of a, a, a bomb had been chucked into society. It was a very strong divide of people who either really believed what Darwin said, or people who didn't at all and believe in the side of God. I think if you look at kind of, you know, whilst we don't live in such a religious, religious society nowadays, I do feel that, you know, there is a lot still to be said around it. Evolutionary theory and history still can be, in many circles, quite controversial. So what makes Origin of Species so important? Well, to add my own sort of personal input into the canon of things that have been said about Origin, I think 
you know, obviously it contains one of the, if not the most important scientific theories ever created, the theory of evolution, which in itself is completely mind blowing. But for me, what fascinates me is more coming from a sort of literary background. Darwin wanted to write Origin, not like a scientist, but like a writer. And I think you can see that across all of his work, that Darwin's always written very much like a writer. He wanted Origin especially. He wanted it to be so succinct and so easy for anyone to understand. If you're a politician or a chimney sweep, Darwin wanted it to be that you could understand it. It's so hard to stress how important this book was, and I think you can look at it as being the most revolutionary text ever published. It absolutely changed everything. And also with that, it is still one of the most banned books ever written. I think Darwin seemed to grab life by the horns. Any opportunity that was presented to him, he seemed to dive headfirst into. But as we've discussed, if you look at his time at school, Darwin was in no way marked for greatness at all. You know, if you said to his teachers that he'd go on to be what, the leading scientist of all time, the idea of that would be laughable. Then at Cambridge, a chance friendship with the professor then leads to his time on the Beagle. That trip on the Beagle changed everything. It changed my life, changed your life, changed all of our lives. It certainly changed Darwin's life. He comes back from the Beagle and publishes the narrative on the Beagle. Again, a chance thing. Fitzroy asked if he could publish one small chapter on it. That chapter became a book and showed Darwin as a stunningly good writer, completely unexpected even to him, I think. From that, Darwin also was developing a scientific theory. He then became a full-on scientist. So I think there's a massive complexity to Darwin in that sense, but also, I've always felt there's a sort of slight simplicity. Above all else, Darwin was a simple family man. He adored his wife, he adored his children. That's why on the publication of Origin of Species, which turned Darwin into a celebrity in his time, he hated that. He didn't want that. He wanted to come up with this theory, but he also wanted to never be in the limelight. He wanted to step away from it. So I think you have a rather sort of a simplistic, but also quite conflicted character there. The Darwin had to get these words out. He was a writer having to get these words onto paper. But then with that, everything that came with it, the life-changing monumentalness of what Darwin had written, he wanted to step away from and just wanted to be with his family. I think he's complex and simple at the same time, which I know is a complete paradox in terms. Why should someone add Origin to their collection? Well, it's a book that completely transcends boundaries. People who collect literature want origin, people who collect science want origin, every collector wants origin. And there are a million reasons why for that. It is not only one of the most revolutionary books ever published, but it's a beautifully worded and beautifully written book. Not only from that, it's also incredibly rare. Only 1,250 copies were published. It is supremely rare and supremely important.